Well, good morning, everyone. This is the day the Lord hath made, and we will rejoice and be what? Amen. Amen. There you go. <sighs> wow, the anointing was strong. Uh, if you're like me, I don't hold back my tears anymore. Used to be taught, my folks never taught me this, but, you know, it's a, it's a shame for a man to cry. I want to tell you, there's not enough men crying. You see, I believe this. I believe when you really start to get deeper with God, that he brings the tears out because that's the way in which he, he causes us to release the hurts and the, sometimes the, the tough things that we've been through. Now, it's not that he, he softens us so that we become wimpy, but he softens us so our heart is not corrupted and our thoughts are, are usually leaning more towards good. Amen? Did you enjoy the light wands? Yeah, amen. You're going you're gonna to enjoy this too. So um, when you get all set, settled down and everybody's ready, we got a special guest in the house. I would like you to meet him. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. I'm John the Baptist here. John the Baptist came up here to say hi to everybody. There's a lot of noise around here, buzzing around here. I don't know what all these things are. So anyway, I wanted to come on up and say hi to everybody, and I come to tell you to repent, to make your path straight, to open up your hearts to the Lord, because he's our only way. For unto you a child is born, and unto us a child, Savior is given. And you're probably wondering what's all this... This uh, stuff I have in my hand here. Well, being a, being a proclaimer of Jesus Christ, only thing I ate was locusts and honey. Tastes pretty good. Chicken. Mm. Yeah, real locusts. Mm. Anybody like any locusts? Tastes just like chicken. Anybody want any locusts? It's, it's good. It's good locusts. A little crunchy, extra crispy, mm. good stuff. Anyway, put a little honey on it. Oh, it's great, honey, honey chicken. Anyway, so good southern dish. <laughs> good southern dish here. And what did this son do? He came to bring us peace, goodwill to mankind, and also. He came to dwell with us, to live with us, live with each and every one of us, and not to leave us, forget about us, like some people, they forget about you. No, Jesus will never forget you, or you, or you, or you. He's our friend, proclaiming the good news to, modern, to mankind, proclaiming the wonderful good news to modern, mankind, that he... That salvation is not just for the rich, not just for the ugly, not just for the handsome, the beautiful, but it's for everybody. For the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Rich, poor, doesn't make any difference. As long as you are who? Right here in Whosville. Right here in Hoosville, Puyallup. Whosoever. Thank God for that. And, great, and honey, too. It keeps you going. Keep Keeps you going and going and going. Go, just call. All you have to do is just call in the name of the Lord. And he gave us the gift of salvation. And we would like to give you a gift also. A wonderful gift. Eat one cricket with honey. Thank you. Merry Christmas, everyone. Amen. So are you guys ready to get in the Word?
you can, stretch your hearts, stretch your hands towards me and pray for me as I want to give you what God has for you today. And I want it to come out of the voice of God and I want it to move in the spirit and uh, you to get exactly what you want out of it. So Lord, we just present this word to you. We ask you, Lord, to let it fall on good ground. We honor you by lifting up Christ in our heart. Father, let our family understand how it is and how wonderful it is to walk with you. Lord, this is not a religious thing. This is a walking with Almighty God. Help us shine, Lord. This Christmas, help us to encourage others, our, our children, our, our relatives, our families. Lord, our friends. And Lord, help them, Lord, to receive what you have for them. In Jesus' name, and we all said... Amen. Well, this is actually called Christmas Eve today, isn't it? Amen. And so that would be the night before Christmas. So God gave me this little word for you. So let me, let me read it to you. Are you ready for this? Are we recording, I hope? Yeah. All right. Twas the night before Christmas, and all through God's house, the Spirit was moving. There wasn't a doubt. God's people were worshiping, lifting their hands in the air. Believing for miracles, the anointing was there. God's children were believing in what God had said. I'll soon be there. Arise from the dead. We have been praying and opening up, knowing God's spirit will fill this cup. Merry Christmas. Amen. That was my little poem for you. Please, don't quit your day job, Pastor Kerry. Amen. What? Yeah, I didn't borrow it from the internet. God gave me that. So when I say that, I'm not lying to you. Amen. So let's get into that. I'm not going to keep you long because this is Christmas Eve. We want you to be with your family and your loved ones. But we also want you to enjoy some snacks, share some testimonies. I want you to reflect because in this New Year's Eve service that we're going to have, I want you to bring your testimonies, what God has done for you this year. Okay? Maybe to get three Maybe four testimonies. Maybe God did this. God, God answered this. God healed me here. Things like that. So be thinking about it for a week, okay? And we want to come back and as we have our Christmas, or excuse me, as our New Year's Eve, here we go again, um, service, it'll be wonderful. I want to share with you the new vision for the year. And of course, you had me, I had leaked it out. So it, God says, look up, draw close, and go deeper with me. All right? What does that mean? Well, James said, draw near to God and he will draw near to you, right? Yes. All right. Isn't this guy good? He's always making stains. I just knocked over my cereal. And that's on tape. Yeah. No napkin, so let me have a sticky face. All right, you ready to get in the word? All right, straight, okay, so let's go ahead and let me uh, go up and bring our, uh, our scripture up just for them to see while I'm reading the paragraph. Today we celebrate the night before Christmas. And one of the things that we want to share for you is God in our walk wants us to focus on the right things. Do you believe God wants us to focus on the right things? How many has ever tried running a marathon or maybe that you were in school and you ran around the track and maybe you were in competition to other runners? What was the main idea for you when you're running? What are you supposed to be looking at? The finish line. And as Christians, that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So the subtitle of this lesson today is, We Shall Behold Him. And the idea is there's so much in the world distracting us, pulling for our attention. We have, some of us have children. I have 11 grandchildren. Wonderful. I love it. But a lot of things are pulling on everyone. But God does not want us to forget to keep beholding Him. Can you say Amen. Because when our eyes slip, our mouth slips. And when our mouth slips, our actions slip. And when we slip for a period of time, we become what is called Mr. Flesh. Not Mr. Flash. I thought Diana would get a kick out of that. Okay? Mr. Flesh. 
you know. So the idea behind it is we need to keep him in front of our eyes throughout our day. And of course, this being Christmas Eve, when Jesus was born, what were everybody's eyes? Were they on everything else? No, their eyes were beholding him. There was the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in a baby. Holy smokies. Amen. So you can borrow that term. I love that. All right. So we're going to read our scripture here in just a second. Are we ready? Now, you guys know this scripture, don't you? But I, I always like to pull out 17 because everybody forgets 17. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Let me stop right there. Jesus in the beginning was the word, right? And when he came to become a human being, that's called begotten. So here God became begotten. So that's why Jesus is called the only begotten son of God. You're sons and daughters of God, correct? But he was the only begotten because he was God, is God, and he came as a man. Let us behold him. And the only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not what? That word means to come to an evil or wicked death, but have everlasting life. 17 says, for God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, to condemn the world, to put the world down, but to what? But the world through him might be saved. Now, if you look at what the church is doing, there's a move of the Spirit of God that's happening. Remember John the Baptist? Oh, there he is right there. You know, remember John the Baptist? He was called the forerunner. He came before Jesus. He baptized Jesus. Now, in the spirit of Elijah, he came. But the Bible says in the last days, there's going to be a revival where the church is going to be like John the Baptist. Now, listen to me. Where he's going to, they're going to forerun the coming of God. That means that we've got to rise up, children. We've got to rise up, child of God. We've got to get the, the fire and, and the things going in our hearts so that people know what we stand for, they know what we speak for, and know how we walk. Someone say amen. amen. God did not send his son into the world, condemn the world. So let me just kind of throw out a warning. You'll see a lot of people that say they're of God, but what they're doing is condemning. Listen, I'm not trying to pick on people in general. Satan is a, a master at deceiving, even Christians. Our job is not to condemn. Our job is to bring Jesus. Amen. Well, well, shouldn't we say something when somebody's doing wrong? Only if God tells you to. Because that thing you say could be taken wrong and they could go get worse. So if you're be led by the Spirit, which by the way, we're going to be teaching a whole lot on. When we're led by the Spirit, we know what to say, when to say it, what not to say. How just to be happy and go, I was hoping to see Adam because he was really curious about the church. Amen. So I, I want to see new faces, new good things going. That's because God has anointed you. So there's a forerunning that's happening. The spirit of God is moving all over the world. Now, only those that get close. Now, listen, only those that are meeting with God, getting close to God, are going to hear the orders of God. They're going to hear the commands of the captain of their salvation. But if the church is just being church, not, not putting anything down, then we might miss the commands of God in our life. We, must miss, we might miss the will of God for us to walk through in our life. There's no happier place to be, BJ, than doing the will of God. Seeing lives change, seeing answers to prayer, right? Come on, give me a cheer and say, thank you, Lord. All right, you guys make some noise. Rise from the dead. Remember the poem. <laughs> All right, we're going to give you, we're going to t touch these four things, and I won't, won't touch them really deeply because I want to, I want to help have you to have a wonderful time with your families. We're going to cover these four areas. Number one, he came through the door. Jesus came through the door. I know you know this truth, but you've got to realize God is a gentleman. Everyone say God is a gentleman. He stands at the door and knocks. He waits for the invitation to come in. Now listen to me. If that's the case when we first got born again, what is God daily waiting for us to do? Ask him to get more involved daily. 
How many here know that God saved you the way you were? Just the way you were, you came to him and he accepted and he saved you. Say amen. But how many know God is so, so brilliant not to leave you in that condition? Good. We're supposed to be growing. We're supposed to be getting better. You're supposed to be getting sweeter and lovelier. You're supposed to be getting more godlike. Can you see, man? I love the godlike part. I really do. Because I can't do that on my own, Scott. Amen. So he came through the door to life and the light of mankind. He's the life and the light of mankind. Thirdly, having a clear image of Christ. Very important. To have a clear image of Christ. But we shall behold him. And then fourthly, we're going to cover this if we have the time. We are children of light. That's why you got the light wands. Can you say amen? Now, I want to let you know, God's light emanates out of you. Let me explain for those coming in. Merry Christmas, everyone. You contain the God of light in your heart, don't you? In your spirit, man. But in order for that to come out, we have to learn to be with God so he conditions us to function correctly. Our job is to proclaim the good news, to give forth the light. He even calls us the light of the world. He says, you don't take a light and hide it under a bushel or under a bed. No, you put light for people to see. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Amen. You are light bearers. You are light carriers. So you have the light inside of you, but it's not any good in here because your flesh is that bushel, is that bed that we hide under. So that's why we take our flesh which covers the glory of God, which tries to be in the forefront and braggadocious to sacrifice and, and crucify it on a daily basis so the light is not hindered coming forth from our lives. Say amen. All right, let's go to our first point. He came through the door. Go with me to John chapter 10. I promise not to stay too long on these, but long enough. While you're going to John 10, remember... God gave this planet to Adam. Again, it would be like, I, I have a property, say this property, and I lease it to, to Scott. So that means that in order for me to come back on my property, I have to have the permission from Scott. Correct? Okay? And if Scott decides to sublease it to one of his rich friends then Scott can't come on the property anytime he wants until he goes through the door. Are you with me? God didn't jump on you, didn't make you get saved. You stood at the door of your heart all your life. And some open up and invite him in and some do not. And I just pray for them. Because guess what? Is our life all that special for us not to receive Jesus? Are you kidding? Every human being goes through hell one way or another. You know they do. We did until we met God and then he gets us out of that. And sometimes it's slow depending on how quick we learn. We have to learn quickly now. There's not much time left. Poke your neighbors gently and say learn quickly. Don't mess around. All right. So John 10, look at verse 1. Most assuredly, when you see that in the Bible, that means really pay attention here. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as the thief and the robber. Just to quickly give you, who's the thief and the robber in the Bible? Satan is. Did he, was he born here? He stole his, Adam's birthright, didn't he? Adam gave the planet over on him. See, this is where a lot of Christians, they don't understand. So once Adam gave the planet to Satan, Satan made it a prison. And then he attacked, tried to attack God. God says, oh no, threw him back down, and then God made it a prison. Underneath your feet, there's some pretty weird stuff. We talk about fallen angels in hell, being held captive. Hello, in, in, in chains of darkness, it says. 
under your feet. So this planet is a prison. For us to be sober about certain truths is very important and us not to be what I call religiously blind. Look at your neighbor and say, thank God I'm not religiously blind. You want to know the truth? Jesus says, you'll know the truth and the truth shall what? All right, so he goes, listen, in order for you to get into the sheepfold, which is the earth here, you've got to come through the door. The door to coming into the earth is being born here. Satan did not do that. He stole his Adam's birthright. So he's called a thief and a, a robber. And so, well, same thing. But anyway, so his job now, because Jesus came, took the keys back. Now you know, when Jesus took the keys back, he got the planet and he got us. Now the problem is, every human being has a, a will. So they either want God or don't want God. God has to honor what they want or don't want. So the enemy comes in, starts messing with people's lives, and most people don't know what they want. They don't know who they are, and so they can't really find any path. Jesus is the way. Jesus is that path. And you know what's neat about a path, Sherry? Sherry's, <laughs> is you could follow a path much easier than wandering through the woods. And Jesus is the path. He's our way. Say amen. amen. So he who comes in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep, he goes on further to say. Who's that? God had to become flesh. Now, we've covered two previous weeks about the word becoming flesh. Amen. And, and last week, we talked about the seed being born, Christ being born, all for the purpose of rescuing his family and human beings. Now, how many here not er know that God wants every human being saved? So in your prayers, pray for everyone to be saved. But not everyone is going to choose to want to receive the salvation. Hello. And salvation also means healing, deliverance, being whole, set free. And when you got born again, maybe you didn't know this, but the Bible, and I'll find it for you if you want to write me and ask me questions, please. It says that when you get born again, God puts a seal in your forehead. Did you know that? You got a seal that says belongs to God. Right here. Amen. Belongs to God. And when we shine forth the light because we're beholding God, when we shine forth the light as we behold God, the light comes forth and the seal shows. And Satan has to back off. But some of us blessed Christians, hallelujah, we go and take matters in our life back in our control and in our hands, and then we go mess something up. And again, I'm not picking on anybody. I'm talking about me too. And then we step out of our hedge into the fire. So slow down. Don't be such a hurry. Remember, the God that pushes is not the God you know in your heart. Jesus is his shepherd. He leads the flock. If you ever feel pushed or, or happen to do this and, and you feel you've got to have, slow down, take a breath. Something is amiss. It takes, just takes a second to do that. Say amen. amen. So he goes on further. And he said in verse 3, To him the doorkeeper, the Holy Spirit opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. Leads them out of what? Well, Leads us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Leads us off of this planet into his kingdom forever. Hello? Leads us out of the hands of Satan's inroads. You know, when we were younger, and all the little things that happened to you and me, some of those were setups from the enemy to try to get little pressure points that as you grow up, and if you get close to God, he could hit those little pressure points and get you off. I used to do that when I was two, Christy. My mom would set up my little, I'd be sitting in my high chair and she put the cereal on there, and I loved my mom, and I liked to knock the cereal off just to watch her wiggle around picking it all up. And I thought that was neat, so when she put the cereal back on there, yeah. guess what I did? Knocked I knocked it off. Then when she goes to get it and puts the cereal on there, guess what? Slap! Don't knock it off. You see, we need some, in some form or another, some form of discipline and some form of regulation so that we know that we're in order and when, when we're not in order. Can you say amen? 
That's why the Bible says that we're to be under God's submission. And it says, it says, don't despise the chastening of the Lord. The word chasten, don't despise your father's corrections because he has the best and, and he has the perfect plan for your life. So you should be welcome. God, correct me. I want you to, if I'm getting out of order, don't let me wander way too far. Remember, you're like sheep, okay? Why does he liken us unto sheep? Because sheep don't have a lot of brains, but they're very loyal. Don't get mad at me, okay? You get a sheep, I mean, this is how they are. You get a sheep by a, a rushing stream, and the, if the shepherd's not controlling that, the sheep will go and wait in to get some piece, little paws, all paws, get the swips all kind of cool and everything. Then the water gets into his wool and pulls right over and they round. That's not too intelligent, is it? What is the enemy doing, trying to do to us? He's trying to pull us over and to drown us. That's why a voice of a stranger we do not follow. That's why we behold him and not our surroundings so much. Say amen. Eyes off the world. Eyes off of others. Eyes off ourselves as much as we can. All right. A couple of points I want to give you. Point one. The door represents two things. Number one, being born again naturally and being born spiritually. So we have to be born naturally in order to be born spiritually, which the scripture says, in order, unless we are born naturally, we can't enter the kingdom of God. So Satan can't enter into the spirit. He wasn't born naturally. But also we got reborn spiritually. Come on, say amen. amen. So now we have access to all the handwriting and all the equipment of God. We need to let the Holy Spirit, though, teach us how to move in them, teach us how to use those equipment. I have classes on just about every gift of the Spirit. I just don't have enough time with you. I want to start a leadership class and teach you how to move in the Spirit. But gosh sakes, this is a joke. It's hard enough just to get you here on Sunday. Knows I paused. Uh, you know I love you with all my heart. The second point I want to give you is remember, this planet is a prison. Still is. God's children were taken captive and were separated from God. Point three, God had to become man. To be born again in this earth naturally. This is the legal entry, what we call into the sheepfold. The sheepfold at that time, Jesus had to be born here in order to die for our sins. He had to have a body. Remember, I come in the volume of the book, which is written of me, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5 through 7, as is written of me, to do your will, O God, a body you have prepared for me. Why did, was God, why did God give him a body like we have a body? So that could take our sins and our sicknesses and our disease and as a scapegoat, carry it away so that you and I don't have to run around being beat down and just like a regular human being. Tell the good news, folks. Tell everybody. Well, what if your kid gets mad at me when I tell him that God loves him? Let him get mad. Now he has, he's in the valley of decision. If you don't share, you are doing worse. Share in love. And if they get mad at you, just let it go. That's their problem. You're trying to help them. So don't let the faces of people intimidate you and keep you from sharing what you're supposed to be sharing. Say amen. Just use wisdom if you're on a job. Let me bring up the next one. Fourth, Jesus must have a physical body in order to have it nailed on a tree. Say amen. In order for uh, him to take all our sins, all our diseases, all our sicknesses, he had to have a physical body. So he was all man, all God. Say amen. Now let me ask you, could God die? No. He had to give back his spirit. So there you see on the cross, Jesus said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. So he separated and became all man with our sin and went right into hell and won the battle for us. Can you say amen? Well, God was examining the blood, and finally Jesus said in his last breath, Father, it is finished. Don't you know? You just need to tell the devil who you belong to and be adamant about it. 
He's frightened that you may really believe what God told you. How many of you really believe? Then walk and talk like it. Amen. And then fifthly, his job was to pay the price and to capture our hearts and our attention and lead us out of this planet. Now, what is he going to do with this planet, Pastor Kerry? He's going to take care of it. Now, if you don't you know, I'm going to go through some timelines for you. Not right now, though. But there's a thing called a millennial reign, where for 1,000 years, we reign with Jesus. We teach the mortals, the people like us, we won't have our mortal body. Well, for a thousand years, we'll be working with Jesus, reigning and ruling. And then after it's done, Satan will be all bound up. Every human being will be removed off the earth, and the earth will be torched. Completely renovated by fire, everything evil, and then moved right back into the sink of God. And there won't be any more devil to worry about sickness, death, and even people will start living long, longer again. So God is not through the humanity or the human race. He wants us, remember the original, he wants us to populate the universe. Can you say amen? And Jesus being born is the beginning of that. For it would be the seed of a woman that would crush your head. All right, let's go to point two. Life and the light of mankind. Who is the life and the light of mankind? Jesus is. Why, why do we talk about Jesus and, and, and then the Father? It seems like all three of them, you know, when I pray to the Father in Jesus' name, am I leaving Jesus out? You know, what about the Holy Spirit? When you pray to the Father in Jesus' name, you're talking to all three of them. Everyone, you're not leaving anyone out. You just might not have mentioned their name. When you say Father in Jesus' name, remember, the Holy Spirit lifts you into Christ. Christ lifts you up before the Father and then sits with you while you have an audience before the face of God. I said before the face of God. Now do something intelligent and ask for other people's lives and that's where you are. You say, we're not like Daniel had to pray from his room. Yes, you might be physically in your room. But when you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I've taught you, I'll teach you again. God lifts you up before his face. That's that face-to-face -face beholding God. That's why in that type of prayer, everyone say, yeah. That's where you grow. Folks, you do not grow out on the field, out in the labors. Out. You don't grow by trying to apply the word. You understand by applying the word. But the spiritual growth of God in us isn't a work. It is a his work. So we don't get God to grow us up. We put ourselves in God's hands so we can. Everyone say amen. And that takes a humble spirit. Because anybody gets full of themselves won't stop long enough to let God change them. Look at your neighbor and say, thank God he's talking about himself. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a sip. Merry Christmas to you. All right, point two. Go with me to John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, and then we're going to look at verse 14. 1 through 5 and 14. I'm so glad they put that up, you know. I remember years ago, I have to repeat several of them, you know, wait till everybody turned the pages and stuff. Okay, so in John 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, right? Three, the very record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And the Word was with God, the Father God. And the Word was God, Jesus is God. He was in the beginning with God. Now listen to this next phrase. All things were made through him, through him. Key, we work through him. Not for him. Let me say that again. You're missing it. Sure, it's noble. and Sure, it's good to work for God. But if that's all you're doing, you're going to burn out, get tired. We work through God. Do you see the difference? When I lay my hands on you, I don't even have a doubt that you're not going to get healing. The healing is going to be there. Because I'm working through Jesus and Jesus working through me. So it isn't me trying to get people healed. So lose that whole thought. 
You're just gooing Jesus on them. You're releasing the glory of God on them. You had me pray for you. You felt the electricity. You all have that because you're conduits. You're full of God connected to heaven. Your job is to learn how to give God outright. Not religiously. Say amen. So listen to this. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was nothing made that was made. In him. Everyone say, I'm in him. I'm in him. Everyone say, I'm in, him. I'm in him. So if I'm out in the parking lot, am I in the building? No. <laughs> so Christians don't get it. Don't get the in him part. Get the in him part and, and him being in us part. Very, very important for us. You are in God indwelt. Not only that, but when you minister for God, you are going through God. You're God shielded, God filled, God everything. The only reason you're having a, such a bad time because you've been doing your own thing for a while. It's the truth. Now, I didn't like those truths because God had to tap me on the shoulder and say, Son, you're working for me. You need to yield to me. Let me work through you. I never get tired. <sighs> now, all of us have been tired. I've been burned out a time or two. I had three kids, one of which went home, and then other two kids, full-time ministry and working at Boeing full-time. You think I was kind of burnt? Sure. Well, you just need to make a decision. No, God made one for me. He moved me out of Boeing. Nobody leaves Boeing, I was told. It's too good of a job. You don't leave Boeing. Where are you going to go? I'm going to be a pastor. Oh, okay. <laughs> and you know, when I got time to leave Boeing, they threw me a party. I, I didn't even know I had touched so many lives. Over 175 people showed up to see me off. And they made me a cake with a Bible on it. It said, Pastor Carey. And then about 30 of them followed me to my first church, all the way from Renton, all the way from Newcastle and Bellevue. They drive down in groups, come to church. I want to see that again. That was the revival that was going on. People were hungry for God. Are you hungry for God? A couple of points. And then it goes on further. In him was life, and the life was the light. I, I thought about this, and I thought, yeah, we receive eternal life. God is eternal life. So I received that. But out of that eternal life shows an eternal light. And that life is the light or enlightenment of man. Aren't you glad you have the life of God in you? Amen. The life is the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, the dark world, full of people following the dark one. And when the light came, we have stories of Christmas and seeing the shepherds and all the wonderful things of the birth of Christ. Can you say amen? What was that all about? That we would behold him. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, it's not, not in my notes, but I'm going to quote it for you. John says, that which is in the beginning, which our eyes have seen and our ears have heard, which our hands have handled, that is the word of life. If you read it in the Greek, it says, that which is in the beginning, that which our eyes have seen, and the Greek goes on, which I can still see when I close them. My ears still hear the voice of Jesus, and even when he's not around, I still hear his words. And our hands have handled him. We remember the anointing. All the good things that God has done. And I still carry it with me today. Huh? Wasn't it Peter and John of the gate beautiful? How about you? Have you behold God so well that your life seems nothing compared to the beauty of your Savior? Is he so clear and understand? Is his image so, so clear to us that we're actually transformed into that image and not our surroundings? Could you say amen? Could you imagine what it would be like if we conform to our worldly surroundings? Be not conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay, you still with me? Yeah. 
Then down to verse 14 in the same chapter, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld. You see it? And we behold what? His glory. As of the only begotten. See, the word became flesh of the Father. And what is he full of? Grace and truth. You see, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? So the closer we get to Jesus Christ, the more truth, the more as it really is comes to light. And grace is God unmerited favor. Did you know you can grow in grace? Did you know God's favor can grow in you and on you? God's grace is really called unmerited favor. And God's grace, if you read about it in the book of Acts, it says that God graced the, the believers so well that even their neighbors came to church. That's why I was so glad to be invited to that Christmas thing yesterday because I went there specifically to plant seeds and to invite people to a place where you grow very quickly here. Wouldn't you say you grow pretty quickly here? Now, I know that we miss a few programs, like Lutherans, they have a wonderful children's program. In fact, I'm, I'm concerned because their programs for children are so good. The adults don't get anything but pablum. <laughs> right? Yeah, so the adults are sitting there starving to death while the kids are just being entertained. That's how you get your church full, folks. If you're going to live carnally, have great children's ministries, and the rest of the adults will just come along. Isn't that a sad way to look at something? We should be bringing our family to church. I want you to come to church with me. I want to go to my own church. No, I want you, as long as you're under my roof, you're going to come to church with me. I don't want you to get bitter, upset, because once you've really tasted the Lord's good, you'll want more. See, we're afraid of that because we, we're afraid that we'll turn our kids off. Where's your faith? God says, as for you and your house, they will serve the Lord. What are you claiming? Hello? Well, I'd like to reach out in my, my living quarters where I live, but I've never bothered to visit any of my neighbors. Sure, you just let them go to hell? We need to be thinking beyond ourselves. We're, always, we're already covered, aren't we? Aren't we covered? Yes. Don't we have a seal in our forehead? Aren't we blessed? Yes. Then what are we not sharing for? That's the way Christians get stale when they try to meet their needs and try to get their blessings and they forget about helping somebody less needy than us. Remember the Christmas carol. Anyway, are you still? We get stale when everything's about us. Come on, it's the truth. We get stale, even the best of us. People that are rich have everything, they're miserable. Because only God satisfies. And you got to have a deep relationship. What's our theme? Look up, draw close, and go deeper. Amen. All right, so let's go to our next point. Having a clear image of Christ. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, please. Now, as you go there, I want to just read a couple of points. Church, we carry God around in our hearts. We must be willing to share him with everyone. Point two, the life of God projects light. So we should blind the devil when we get up in the morning. That's why I believe that if you would just do what God told me to do, meet with him first thing. You don't have to be there very long. He gets you all ready for your day. He can give you the wisdom. He can even know if somebody's out here going to mess with you. And you can deal with that. But the problem is, now don't get mad at me, the dividing crossroad of you actually meeting with God every day has to be a humble, loving decision. And if you don't do that, you're simply, there's too much of you living for God. Not enough of you surrendering to God. Now, I'm not trying to pick on us. But, you know, to get into habit, here's another thing. Husbands and wives, you better start off your day praying together as well. Why? Because we're living in what kind of days? 
and Satan is loose around this planet, my job as your pastor to get you focused, beholding God, doing what is right. And it's very little God requires of us so that he could do all the rest. But if you're living under the circumstances constantly, things are breaking, messing up and everything, you know somebody else is around. Bind that up. Get yourself right with God. And I'm, when I say get yourself right with God, that doesn't mean you're out there sinning. It simply means you're out of phase, out of tune. You know what that feels like when uh, uh, something's not going, Lord, Get me back in sync. Just takes like that. Lord, get me back in sync in Jesus' name. Thank you. Just pause her say, boop, who's your right in? We don't do that because we've never been trained to do that. Hello? We were trained how to walk. How's your walking? Everybody's walking pretty good. Uh, yeah. Tina's coming along. So her walking's doing good. She's, have you seen how far God has brought our sister Tina? Isn't that? And I bet you it's through Ellen's prayers too. Amen. And I bless, I bless her just to see what God has done. The first, I can't tell you, but ask me after service the first time I met Tina. That's why, we do, that's why we really don't go by what the sight of our eyes or the hearing of our ears. Because then we can make previous judgments. And if I would have done that instead of claiming her soul and claiming her and God taking care of her and everybody else doing, then she wouldn't be here. When are we going to realize the ones that fight the hardest are the ones that are close to getting saved? Can I tell you a quick story? And then, I, years ago, we used to go to Kegers. How many remember those? Don't wave your hands. But we went as Christians to go share Jesus. And so Dennis and Daryl Randall, um, was David Randall, a whole bunch of people were in a van. We just came back from what we call Saturday Night Live. We used to have a Bible study off of Pearl Street in 35th, and we called the Bible study in Daryl's house called Saturday Night Live because all kinds of stuff would happen. Casting out devils, people get healed. One lady come in there, completely changed. Anyway, it's the whole story. Saturday Night Live. But what we would do is afterwards, if we had the time, we'd get together and we'd go share Jesus with people. Well, down the street, there's a little college in Fred houses, you know, frat houses. Fret houses, I said, for, that might be that. Frat houses. And they were having a kager. I said, guys, let's go bust the kager. They're looking at me. Do you really think God will let us do that? I said, absolutely. We go in the right heart. So we walk up here. Let me tell you quickly. And, of course, there's a bouncer right out in front. He's Mr. Buff, you know. His job is to charge you $3 to get in. So we came up. None of us want to pay for their booze. So we said, we didn't have any money. We're just Christians. We want to share our faith. That's all I said. Now, would you have done that? I don't know if I would have done that again. Look at the bouncer who's been drinking. We just come to share Jesus. He looks at us. He says, go on in. So five of us went in. Some went up upstairs. Some went up, up, up upstairs because it was one of the big houses. I went downstairs by the keg, and we all had tracks. And, man, they're out there sharing, and they're getting, pe they're getting people saved because this is a Lutheran college. So they're, they're open to God, but they're doing the wrong thing. So you never assault people. You go in there, and you draw them. So I'm down by the keg, and just to make a long story, I hear all this cussing, this foul language. This nastiness. And I, I'm downstairs and I hear this voice. You blankety blank blank Christian, what are you doing in my cake? What are you doing here in our party room? And I need mean, this cussing and screaming. Next thing you know, you hear this. Bleep! A bunch of people had grabbed him because he was yelling and threw him out on his ear on the lawn. And we prevailed and got people saved. So sometimes you just got to obey God. Now, here's what happened. The next day was the Christmas program, the Singing Christmas Tree at Life Center. And we were there. We had tickets. So I'm watching it. And right after every singing performance, they have an altar call. Guess who I saw run into the altar? The drunk they threw out on his ear because he was a backslidden Christian. He's been away from God. Usually those are the ones that are most onerous. They're so close. 
So don't go by your eyes. Don't go by your ears, okay? You go by your spirit. He knows. I hope that story blessed you. Now, don't go be running out looking out for keggers. You be led of the spirit. But remember, there's a lot of things I'd like to share with you. Back then, I had a whole lot of faith, but not very many brains. So let's move right on. Go with me, 1 Corinthians 13 again, verse 11 and 12. Look, what, this is Paul speaking. He says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, born again, I put away childish things. For now we see through a mirror dimly. Folks, we don't see everything, do we? When we come face to face with God, we're going to see everything because we're going to be in heaven. But when you and I meet with God, listen, face to face every morning, he will show us glimpses of things to come. Can you say amen? Especially dealing with you. God's not going to sit me down and reveal all the problems of Scott to me. No, he's going to talk with me. He's going to minister to me. He's going to show me where I need to be working. God is not a tattletale. Say he's not a tattletale. So he will never tell me anything personal about you. He just tell me if you have trouble or you have an area I need to pray for. If you're hearing voices saying they're doing this and they're doing that, it's not God because he doesn't tattle on his kiddies. Say I got it. Got it. Good, good. He doesn't come to me and say, hey, Pastor Kerry, let me tell you about my daughter, BJ. <laughs> he doesn't do that. Uh -uh. He says, pray for her. She, she needs strength right now. That's about all he will say. Why? Because he expects me to do what he said. He will stop asking you to do things if you won't do the first things he said. I'm going to say it again. Many people say, well, why, why am, aren't I being used to God more? Because you haven't done the things he said right away. You're sort of lingering around. That's doubt and unbelief. Some say, oh, no. Look at the last part of this. For now we see it through a mirror dimly, but then face to face to God. See, we're supposed to be meeting with God face to face. Now I know in part, and then I shall know just as I am known. Go with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verses 3 through 6. But even if our gospel is hidden, it is hidden to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. And remember, Satan is blinding everybody. He's having the governments hide things and stuff we really need to know. This is a government of the people, for the people, and by the people. Can you say that? Amen. And did you know, even our own president doesn't know what's going on. The cabal is seeming to run this country. Pray, my friends. And that's not a rumor. That's not some kind of a conspiracy thing. That's just a fact. We have a committee running this nation. It was never meant to be that way. Anyway, go on and pass. Look at what this says. But even if our gospel is veiled, now go to the next scripture, verse 5. For we do not preach ourselves, aren't you glad? But Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves for you, bondservants, for Jesus' sake. For, for it is the God who commanded. Now listen. Remember, we're to behold Jesus. We're celebrating his birth. For it is God who commanded light bringing the sun into the world to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts, we have Jesus in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Where do we find it? What's the next phrase? Where do we find the light for wisdom and knowledge and to grow into God? In the face of Jesus. That's what it says. Well, where are you going to see the face of Jesus? I can't see the face of Jesus. Well, when I sit down and, and talk with, uh, like, like well, if I talk with Mike and have a conversation, we're face to face, aren't we? Hello? When I sit down with you and we, we talk, isn't that a face to face talk? So when you sit down and you pray, God's face is right up to yours. 
Put a smile on it for one. Stop carrying around your burdens. I'm going to get a backpack. It's going to say my burdens. And I'm going to walk in one day and I'm going to kind of be hung over. Not hung over that way, but with the back plate. And you'll say, well, pastor, what are you doing carrying around all these burdens? Why don't you cast your burdens over on the Lord? What an idea. And some Christians are walking around carrying everybody's load, everybody's weight, and everybody's concern. So Joanna, don't do it anymore. And so you got this big backpack on. Throw it off to Jesus. My goodness. We used to, when we were in Boy Scouts, we used to pick on the nerd. Excuse my, the guy was, was dumpy, lumpy, and bumpy. And we give him all of our equipment to carry around. You know, I was kind of smart how like I was. I was a leader. I wasn't in the football team. Are you kidding? Only a fool would get bit up like that. I was in the band. Who do you think was dating the football player's girlfriends while they were playing football? <laughs> and excuse me, it's just for fun. God has a sense of humor. And so I'd be under the bleachers. We'd be necking and smoking and doing it and all that kind of stuff. And then was time. Then we'd get up and march for, for our, our thing and for our football team. So you see, the whole world society is this corrupt. Aren't you glad you have Jesus? Because I can remember my high school days. I was a leader. I've always been a leader. So you can see God didn't change the gift that I had. He just changed the God I serve. Hello? He didn't change your gifts. You are good at what you do because God put that in you. Now use it for Jesus. You're using it for Jesus, see. Are you with me? You guys are happy, aren't you? Merry Christmas. Amen. It goes on further to say, for it is God who commanded light. Now go with me, 2 Corinthians again, but we're going to go back to the left. One, one back, one one chapter, we'll be in 2 Corinthians 3 now, verse 14 through 18. But their minds were blinded, for until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. Folks, that's why God wants you when you read the Old Covenant Read it in the eye and the lordship of Jesus. Otherwise, we get to practicing truths of the word of God. But next thing you know, you'll switch out of the new covenant with new promises back into practicing the old covenant, which is completely obsolete. So what the devil does is he gets people switching from both covenants. We got people waving the flag, but they're doing the feasts and they're doing all of it's wonderful. But then if you ask them why they're doing it, I don't know. If they say to me, I'm doing it because Jesus is Lord and Jesus has come and I'm forgiven by sin. Wonderful. Keep on doing it. But if you're waving flags and you stop using the name of Jesus and you start praying the name of Yahweh and Jehovah and all that and you don't use that, then you are being converted into a Jew, which is forbidden. There's only natural Jews. The closest thing to a Jew that you and I become is when we accept Jesus, then we're circumcised in heart and we're spiritual Jews. Can you say amen? And God is no respecter. He doesn't see male, female. He doesn't see bond, free. He doesn't see Jew, Gentile. He doesn't see any of those. He sees a child of God that loves him. See, that's me. That's why we're not to compare our walks with each other. That's why I'm not to say, well, Scott's better than I. He seems to be getting his prayers more answered than myself. Stop thinking that way. Your eyes are not on Jesus. Your eyes are on humans. And boy, you want to get burned? Keep watching humans. I mean, think of the, the laughter the devil has. Getting all those humans into a big stadium, watching two teams run around. Now, it sounds like I'm down on football. I love football. I love baseball. Uh, I was a very good baseball player. I was a pitcher. I was shortstop, third base. And I, uh, my dad was the coach, so I got all the heads ups. 
but I love all of sports. But you think about it. Here the enemy gets this great big stadium, fills them full of beer and what else, and they're all... <laughs> great. But let's move that into church, except for the beer. <laughs> Hello? That's what's missing in the church. We have already won. We've already won. We should be walking around with a big grin on our face, eyes gleaming. Somebody asked me the other day, man, you look like you just got up from a nap. Listen, every time I go to pray, I cry. And when I cry, my eyes stay red for hours. So don't accuse me, uh, you know, of, you got red eyes. I'm just like Jesus. His eyes are fire. No, I can't help but when I start praying, I cry. And when I cry, my eyes get bloodshot. All right? Say, I got it. it. So if you see me come into church and my eyes are totally bloodshot, and say, Pastor, have you been praying? And I'll look at you and say, yeah, for you. (laughs) Bless you. Are you with me? Amen. My eyes are probably red now. I wept during the worship. Folks, don't hold back what God wants to do in your life. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. He made you. He knows how you tick. All right, let's move on. Are you with me? Their minds were blinded. But after Moses is read, see, it's still blinded. But nevertheless, verse 16, nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the blindness, the veil is taken away. That's why I want you to meet with God on a regular basis so you don't walk around blind. Satan doesn't get in, in over you. Hello? Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. But we all, everyone say, we all, all. with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are being changed into the same image. Our job is to have a clear image of who Jesus is, and to focus on him starting off every day, and he'll guide us, and we continue to follow him. Remember I talked to you about following the Lord? That means you're behind him, not in front of him. It says, walk after the Lord. It didn't say, walk after the flesh. So when you walk after something, you're following it. Right? Our job is to follow Jesus. And who can defeat Jesus? Do you know anybody can defeat Jesus? How about the devil? Can he defeat Jesus? And if Jesus is out in front of you, guess what? Satan has to move out of the way. And believe me, it, and it works. I can tell you plenty of testimonies where they, people just moved out of the way. You can see it in Jesus' life. He walked right through the crowd, yet they wanted to throw him off a clip. How do you walk like that? Keep your mouth shut. <laughs> That's two-thirds of the problem. We feel something, we have to talk about it. Somebody does something, we have to talk about it. We don't have to talk about it. Only talk about it when God allows you to. Sometimes we just need to Keep our lips when we go into the house, house of God. A couple of points. Notice, without Christ, we then walk in the flesh. I don't know about you, but I don't like to be in the flesh. I'm not a very pretty guy in the flesh. We only then see glimpses of God. See, we, we see through a glass darkly. But you know, when we get with God on a regular basis, he takes the blindness away. I can get up in the morning. First, thing, first person I see is God. I meet with him in such a regular place, I, I can see his face. Well, Pastor Kerry, look at here. Now, this is not a, a really perfect picture of him, but this is what he looks like. I have a copy of what Jesus looks like. I stood before Jesus for three, four minutes on a, a footstool with 30 people seeing him too, and he called me into the ministry. I know what he looks like. Jesus has long hair, Tina, right down to here. Not the short hair as you see the artist saying, this is the real Jesus. You know why? Say, I want to know why, Pastor Kerry. Do you guys remember a guy named Samson? What was he noted for? His long hair. When did he get in trouble? When his girlfriend cut it. Jesus was a Nazarite. Jesus of Nazareth. He had a Nazarite bow because he has to fulfill every scripture written about him. So he didn't drink wine. He didn't touch certain things. Even though he sat with wine drinkers, 
and gluttons. He sat around them. Why? Because he came to save sinners. He never drank. He was a Nazarite. He would have disqualified himself. So next time somebody wants to justify drinking, oh, thank you, Jesus. You know, and I'm not putting you down if you have a beer or that. Do it. Do it discreetly because some people are looking for your faults so they won't have to do what you're doing. Don't give them fault to look at. If you want to go sneak off, this is why I used to tell everybody because I had such a large church. It says a lot of you are going to go out and do things you think you're sneaking and, and, and taking care of. I, I don't care about that part. What I care about is how your walk is doing and how you're doing spiritually. But if somebody else sees you and you stumble them, now you're in big trouble. Because when we start stumbling other people, it's a big trouble. Okay, because every one of them are potential children of God. So if, I used to tell them, I said, you're going to go out and tie one on and, and just because you're mad at the world, go off by yourself. God will have a nice talking with you while you're doing it. But don't affect everybody else. Say amen. amen. Good. So I'm not giving you the license to sin. We all have weaknesses. But when you do it, try not to stumble anybody. Say amen. amen. All right, let's move on. I got to turn my page, and I'm almost done with you. We are to focus on who? Jesus. So God can command the light to illuminate us. We're not focused on Jesus. We're not meeting with Jesus. Then God cannot command the light to illuminate us. Because our focus is everywhere else. We're cameras, remember? I'm a Polaroid camera. Whatever I focus on, a point and click, it's going to produce on that film. You're watching your problems. You're looking at your messed up life. You're talking about all your this and all that. Guess what's going to come out? More of that. Zit click, zit click. Start focusing on Jesus. What's going to come out? Zip, Jesus. Start focusing on loving other people and following the word. Zip, Jesus. Amen. All right. And finishing. Yes. Last point. We are children of light. Do you believe that? So let me go through some scriptures. Be sure you write them down in here case I didn't go through them all. Okay. Ephesians 5, verse 8 through 11. See, so it says, you were once darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk. The word walk there means beat a trail and make it a habit. When you see the word walk, it's the Greek word parapeteo. It means beat a trail, make a habit. Okay? Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out as you with God, what is acceptable to the Lord? And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Folks, when I was away from the Lord, when I lost my first church, my life was falling apart. My mom was dying of Lou Gehrig's. My dad had to quit his job. He was the vice president of a very well-known corporation. Whole life just completely. A very successful pastor, but my mom... She was a Sunday school teacher. She ran my food bank, and she ran my uh, children's church. She, and she was the administrator of it. And then she got deathly sick. And if you know anything about Lou Gehrig's, that means that she has a full mind about her, but she can't get any of her motors to work. And the last to go is her heart and lungs. And we watched her die. And we believed, and we believed, and she believed, and believed, and believed. And right during all of that, the lovely people of God just turned on me. Because they wanted me to be a hero. Listen to me. You have to take your eyes off of the ministers and the teachers and stuff. They're just servants like you are. And get your eyes back on Jesus because he's our focus. And the reason why he's our focus, because he's our friend. He's our shepherd. He's our captain. Can you say that? He's the author and the finisher. He is what the Father wants us to focus on. Because Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Are you with me? So without centering around Jesus, we won't find the balance. We won't find the strength that we need. So don't think you're leaving the Father out when you're hanging around Jesus. Because that's where God wants to focus. Because he's the prime center of what exactly the Father is doing and will do. Say amen. Face to face with the center focus. It goes on further. 
2 Corinthians 4, verse 6 says, For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who shined in our hearts as we dwell looking at the face of Jesus. So the idea is to not be so distracted and to meet with God so that we can start off focused. How many here has ever either been in a small airplane or piloted one? I have momentarily. But they have some inter instruments in the, in the small plane. And they got once called an attitude. Did you know that? In the plane, in order for you to know how close you are to the ground, and how tipped you are, they call the little dial there an attitude. Attitude altimeter, okay? And so you see that, and you can tell if you're leaning to the right or leaning to the left because it's got a plain deal. And if you ever played an airplane game or in the videos, you can see they have one of those. But if you don't pay attention to that instrument, you could run right into a mountain. You could run right, the ground could come right up under you. Because even you could be turning and thinking you're going straight. Hello? Jesus is your attitude. Let him reign in your heart and let him keep you straight and balanced. Say amen. amen. Let him guide your way so you don't run into a mountain. You don't do circles. I'm just coming around that mountain one more time. I've been coming around that mountain. Well, Pastor Kerry, how come you're not learning anything? Because I'm prideful. And I don't care. Have you ever noticed why people grow so long and then suddenly they get to this place where they no longer can be t taught anything? Have you ever ran into anybody like that? You can't tell them everything. They know everything. How many know it's very dangerous for us to be that way? You, you get up and be a child every day. Humble yourself. And finishing... 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 4 and 6 says, But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that the day of God's coming overtake you as a thief. But you are all sons of light, sons of the day, and are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep. Don't be a lukewarm Christian, as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Sober there means be alert-minded. Folks, you having a party? Be alert who comes in and who doesn't. If you've got a bunch of people coming over and you're hanging out with, I remember I hung out with such weird people that I'd always have my hand over my glass. Unless they drop some acid in there or something. Come on. Guys, you, thank God God saved you from this. And so you go around, not trust. I was, I've been drugged three times. It was across the street from my mother's house one time, and somebody thought they would put some angel dust in my pot pipe, and they put too much. I ended up smoking a hit and then passing out on the floor. I thought it was dying. Listen, our job is to run with the attitude of Christ. There are people, they're in the streets, in the hallways. There are people in the, in the gutters. There are people whose lives are so broken, they need to hear the good news. So as you're out for Christmas, share your faith and, and share the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, I know that you can't save the world and you can't carry every stray human being home with you, but you can reach out and give them seed and give them hope. Can you say amen? So that day will not overtake you as a thief. And then finally, 1 John 1 1 John 1, 5 and 7. This is a message that we have heard from him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. But if we walk in the light as Christ is in the light, that's how we start off our day, then the blood of Jesus Christ constantly covers and protects us. We're constantly being dosed with the ghost. Hello. Because our eyes are on the one who's the author and the finisher of our faith. So let me leave you with this. We shall behold him. If you got something out of that, will you give the Lord a praise?